So as Jeffrey mentioned, um, a while back I worked for MailChimp. Back in 2008, I joined uh, MailChimp, and you saw a little bit of my work the past couple days. The uh, Freddy High Five um, was, was one of the things I worked on. Um, I joined as the fourth, uh, fourth employee and, and started that design team there. Um, and we, we added a lot of people. We grew tremendously over the years. And in the early days, it was pretty easy to talk about design and bring people into the process and get feedback. But as we grew, things shifted a lot. Um, I used to be able to just go talk directly to the head of engineering and, and get feedback, and we'd collaborate on, on making a new feature, shipping a new product. But then we had 150 people. That's Dunbar's number, the, the number of social connections that we can hold in our head. And you get past that, and you start to get to these inflection points where it's harder to know who to talk to about different things that you need to collaborate on, harder to solve problems. New teams pop up. And with those new teams, there's new specialization. With new specialization comes new language. And I'll be honest with you guys, since we're amongst friends here, I struggled. It was challenging. So fast forward eight years to 2016, We'd shipped a lot of uh, product, uh, grown the team tremendously. I had a great, great time, but uh, by 2016, I was tired. I just needed a little bit of a break, and I, I took a break. Ironically, I came here to Orlando with my family. We went to Disney World. Turns out it was the most stressful vacation uh, that I could have chosen uh, on a time of taking a break. Um, my two-year-old ran off two times and couldn't find him, so that was a little complicated. I took that time and I reflected about our growth, my growth, working so hard to level up my communication skills, my leadership skills as the company grew so I could live up to the challenge that was on my shoulders. And I felt a bit of shame and sadness that there were times where I, I could have done better. I know I could have done better. I ended up joining Envision a few months later and now my team, the design education team, we look at things with a different lens. Kind of think of it as when I was at MailChimp running product teams, leading product teams, I was thinking about design, looking at it through a microscope. And now, because I visit a lot of companies, I see inside a lot of different design teams, thousands of design teams, millions of customers, and I start to see the same patterns over and over again those problems that I had communicating that are leading to problems in companies that you know, make products that we all use. Your bank guaranteed your design team is encountering the same sorts of things. Facebook, Twitter, all of these brands that we're very familiar with, Target, same stuff, same stuff. And that was sort of consolation for me. Misery loves company, I guess, that it's not just me, it's all of us. We're struggling to communicate effectively at scale. So it's a unique perspective now to, to see broadly um, across lots of different types of companies and visit them in person, interview them. I want to share some of the, the things that I've learned because I have learned a lot the past few years leading this team at Envision. Um, we capture these stories and we synthesize the best practices. We find these are the pitfalls, these are the things that trip people up most significantly over and over again, and these are the practices that actually lead to success. I would like to give you guys a shortcut to go around the pitfalls and reach success faster. So I'm going to share my perspective, but I'm also going to share the perspective of the people that I speak with on a regular basis. You'll hear from Google, Facebook, um, companies you know and some you may not, and how they're solving problems. And hopefully that resonates and connects to the, the challenges that you're facing. So there's a break point that I see with all of these companies. It's pretty similar. Is that you get mo people, you get mo problems. Um, it is hard when your days become all about meetings, right? Meetings? Been to a few? Yeah. Um, more people, you hire more people and it's exciting because you feel like we've got more capacity, we could do more, we can produce more, but there's more communication that's required to bring people together to be functional. Why is that? Well, let's look at it. So if you've got three people 
you have three lines of communication. If you have four people on your team, you've got six lines of communication. Five people, 10 lines. Six people, 15 lines. You get to 14 people, which is not a very big team, by the way. That's 91 lines of communication. That's complicated, exponentially complicated. This is what we feel on a regular basis, but we just don't see it and think of it this way. So it turns out this breakpoint of communication, the underlying uh, supporting structure of the problem here is language. I mentioned as a, my experience of seeing MailChimp grow, just, just a few of us working together to hundreds of us and millions of customers, that that language became more specialized. And it's hard to understand one another. We get together in meetings and we communicate, but it doesn't hit home. People don't understand what the hell you're talking about. So um, as language specializes, teams begin to fragment. And let me give you an example. Here's somebody that I've spent a fair bit of time talking with. This is Stanley Wood. He's director of design at Spotify. And he came into a very engineering-centric organization. Spotify is well-known and, and um, emulated for their agile structures of squads and so forth. Maybe some of you actually have teams that are built that way. So Stanley comes in there trying to, you know, bring design culture to a very engineering-focused company. And he said, you know, engineers, they just didn't understand me when I said, this work is of poor quality. So I had to change my language to something that they could relate to. I told them about UX crashes that required immediate attention, and that means you need to stay over this weekend until we get this solved, and design debt that we'd have to deal with. And they started to get the message. So as these teams grow and companies grow, it's essentially a tower of Babel. We can't understand one another. We think we are adding capacity by adding more people, but we have to work to actually uh, you know, achieve that capacity growth. So language turns out is a really important thing because it shapes the work. If we're designers, if we're engineers, product managers, we're in agencies dealing with clients, language shapes the work. If we're working in companies, it's going to shape the culture, the culture of your team, the culture of the other teams, the company's culture. Our language will shape that. And ultimately, that's going to shape partnerships. And if there's one thing, one thing I learned from eight years at MailChimp and now uh, two and a half years studying lots of different types of companies, it's that this word partnership is so key to everything we do because we're not pushing pixels on our own. It, design on any level is a team sport. We're all doing it together. So let's speak the language of good design. It seems like that's such an essential skill. Why is it an essential skill? Of all the people I have seen let go over the years, either you know, they were fired or encouraged to move on to new pastures, I can't think of a single time where it was because of hard skills, because they didn't have the chops to build the thing. It was because their soft skills were deficient. So let's think about soft skills, right? We want to build careers. We want to keep our jobs. We want to you know, build, build the life that we want. Soft skills, language, communication, so essential to being successful in our careers. So let's talk about the work and how language shapes the work. I'm gonna give you a few key words, some definitions that um, are, are worth jotting down and remembering to, to fold into your language. The first is visibility, because as companies grow, visibility, uh, it, it dissipates. It, it, it goes away. Everything becomes opaque. I'm not sure what's happening, what team's working on it, who's responsible for what. We've got to have meetings to get all these people together so we can show the stuff, get feedback, etc. The state of being able to be seen, um, the degree to which something has attracted general attention. So visibility is important, um, but this is what I typically see. This is a, a typical um, 
you know, studio at, at a, a tech company or any sort of company with a design department. Um, it looks a lot like this. I see rows of desks. I see a lot of computer monitors. I see a lot of headphones, people, you know, plunking away, making the things. Uh, a couple years ago, I gave a guest lecture at the Stanford D School, and I noticed that it looked very different than all the companies that I visit. In fact, it looked a little bit chaotic. It, it looked um, messy. There was a lot of stuff on the walls. You could put things up and take things down. Um, you could tear things apart, move things everywhere. But the work was there. I could see it on the post-it notes. I could see the ideas. I could see the fluidity of the ideas moving throughout the space. And it made me wonder, like, why did the D School design their space this way? I went to art school, and I remember, you know, spaces like this. So why, why does this, is this what companies look like? We've got to clean it all up and make it look nice. But this is how thinking happens. This is how we're trained. I talked to David Kelly about it. He's the guy that, that co-founded IDEO, and uh, he, he founded the, the D School. He said, consciously or not, we feel and internalize what the space tells us about how to work. When you walk into most offices, the space tells you that it's meant for a group of people to work alone. That's what our office spaces tell us. Come on in, do your work on your own. Hopefully we can coordinate all these hundreds or thousands of people and make this stuff work. So communication flows best when the work is visible. The work has to be visible. We've got to get it out of these aluminum boxes where we're plunking away, getting it onto the wall, onto boards, or I work in a totally distributed team, and this is an important uh, value at, at Envision, is that we want it visible and accessible to a lot of people digitally as well, so people can comment and, and share and, and work on it together. Um, communication is best when, when the, the work is visible. And the reason why this is so important is design that's not visible, if people can't see it, it's very mysterious. What is it that they do in the design department? They make things look really nice and pretty. So we'll just go over there and say, hey, we've got this project coming up. Could you make it look real nice for us? We'll need it by October 21st. All right, thanks. See you then. That's not valuing design. If I had a buck for every time I've heard someone say, hey, design doesn't have a seat at the table. They don't value us. They don't, they don't get that we create value for the company. I hear that all the time. If the work's not visible, it can't be understood. And if it can't be understood, it can't be valued. And so then people don't value what we're doing and our work doesn't feel very satisfying. So if you're, if you're curious about creating spaces that lead to more collaboration, there's an awesome book. Turns out the Stanford D School actually wrote a whole book on this topic. And it's called Make Space. You can find it on Amazon right now. It's fantastic. Design reviews are also a really important part of communication. Um, what I typically see in, in a lot of companies, not all, um, the companies that are struggling uh, more tend to have design reviews where there's work that's put up and there's a meeting call and people come in and they say, here's the work, tell me what you think. And then people talk about it, they share a lot of opinions, we walk away and then we kind of adjust. But that's flawed in a few ways. Uh, my friend Bob Baxley, he's a former Apple guy. He um, worked under um, Eddie Q, reported directly to him, um, and worked under Steve Jobs during the launch of the iPhone. Um, and he, his team created the, uh, the e-commerce store for Apple. And he, he has very strong opinions. And he said, you know, forget everything else. Design reviews are the heart of any high-functioning design team. He's got a point. I don't totally agree with it, but I do agree that, that design reviews are the heart of any design team. Um, so des design reviews, when they're done well, they you want to invite people into the process. I mentioned about you know, scale and opacity and people not understanding your work and not valuing it. Um, design reviews are a great way to bring people in and help them see the work and be consulted and share opinion and share perspective that you don't have. So we don't want just de designers there. There are some times where a design review is just designers, but it's great to have lawyers there because they do have perspective that will affect the work. 
it's great to have engineers there because they're definitely an important partner of ours. Uh, front end developers, marketers, lots of different types of people might have perspective to offer you. Laura Martini, um, who is on the Google Analytics team, she, um, in her career, she's always done this. She said, I often invited influential people in the company to my team's design reviews so our work remained visible. Again, this theme of, of making the work visible, but also getting executives aware of the process instead of a big you know, reveal of we've been working on it for a long time, there's a grand reveal, here it is, I hope you love it, um, and you find out maybe we're down the wrong path for a very long time and you've wasted a lot of time and energy. So you want to bring other people in, not just designers, to design reviews. But you don't want everyone there, because if you have everyone there, it's very hard to be productive. Um, it's not a party. We're trying to have a productive, moderated conversation. So generally, you want to limit to about five to six people who can attend. There will be multiple design reviews, so you can have different people join at different times. Stanley Wood, uh, the guy from Spotify, um, he traveled and visited a lot of different companies to see what led to success, kind of doing the same thing that, that we do. And he noticed that a lot of companies that had design reviews really nailed down. Uh, they would do a special design review for accessibility, for you know, brand standards, et cetera, et cetera. So they'd have specific design reviews and bring the right people in. And design reviews that are really productive are facilitated. They're not, here's the work, what do you think? There's a facilitator that helps everyone get on board and sets the stage of here's what we're trying to achieve and guides us through the process. So I'm going to share with you the process that the Google Ventures team uses. Um, they have historically, I don't know if they're still using this because they're uh, sort of a different team these days, but if you're not familiar with uh, Google Ventures, um, they, they end up um, going into a lot of companies that they've invested in, and they try to help them solve problems, design problems, technical problems, to increase the odds that their investment will take off because um, that company can be successful. Their process is not unique. I've seen this in lots of other places. It's just that they've packaged it up in a very nice way. It goes like this. First, you set the stage. And setting the stage often is an email. You can send an email out inviting those five to six people. Uh, we're going to meet at this time. Here's what we are going to review, setting a few expectations there. Um, once people arrive at the review and the work's up, visible, the moderator starts by, let's review the business goals. Here's why we're making this particular feature, this product, whatever it is we're making. This is how this will help the business, or we hope so. So specific KPIs that you might have, re more retention, um, you know, helping people on board, whatever that might be. So reviewing the business goals and then reviewing customer goals. Here's what our customers are trying to do. Uh, these are the types of customers that are joining, uh, signing up for the platform, um, and these are the typical goals that they have getting started. So providing a little context for the conversation. And then we start to review the constraints. We have this team working on this, and we're going to ship by this particular date is our target launch date. Um, you know, whatever constraints that might affect the launch, so people aren't saying, oh, man, it'd be so amazing if you did X, Y, Z, but that's just not even possible with the time frame that you have. Part of that, those constraints are, of course, reviewing the schedule because schedule will de determine a lot of what's possible and set expectations on fidelity. Okay, so what you're going to see is a prototype. Um, it's still early days. A lot of things aren't clickable and they don't work all the way, but some things do. So I'm going to guide you through that and then you direct the feedback. The type of feedback that we're trying to get today is about the workflow for onboarding, so something very specific. You frame the problem here for them. Uh, Scott Birkin, who I think he's spoken at Invent Apart a few times, a really sharp guy, he's written a lot about design critiques. Design critiques, design reviews are relatively similar, synonymous. He said if there are three specific questions you want answered, define them right up front. Without goals, everyone will work from different assumptions, and it'll be more of a brainstorm meeting than a critique. So people just sort of go, you know, give all kinds of feedback if you don't frame it up front and say, we're trying to talk about these specific things. Then the feedback. Here's how feedback should work. 
of course, you, it should be candid. There's a lot of like, oh, this looks so great. Um, man, I love what you did with this and, and, and that. That's okay, that's great. It's nice to, nice to be appreciated for your work. Uh, but we want candid feedback that will help push the, the work forward. And we wanna be very specific. I had a, an English teacher who's also an acting teacher. He told me, um, never say candy bar when you can say Snickers. I love that. It's such a great reference. Um, it's about being specific because when we're specific, we have clarity. We have more clarity than if we're vague. So we want to be specific in our feedback. And we talked about those goals. The facilitator framed the, the design uh, review with those goals, business and customer goals. Let's tie, try to tie all that feedback back to those goals to make that as clear as possible. Let's affirm what's working. This is the, the hey, you're doing a great job. This part makes a ton of sense. Uh, let's do that. It's, it's useful to, to, to be there. But don't go straight into solutioneering of like, I see what you're doing here, but what you really should have done was X, Y, Z. Let's talk first about the problems. Let's look at the work. Let's talk about the work. Um, identify the problems, the shortcomings. Um, later on, we can talk about the potential solutions. And we want to make suggestions, not mandate. This really needs to change. And for those of you who might be in some sort of a leadership position, if you're a director or a manager of some sort, um, this one is really important for you. Because if you start to use language that sounds like a mandate, guarantee that that individual contributor who's reporting to you directly is going to go back and just follow what you said. You want them thinking for themselves, not just literally executing. They're not your hands, right? They're your hands and, and, and a brain. So that's, that's the structure of a good design review. When do these happen? Well, there's definitely a, a best cadence, or uh, you know, some, uh, cadence is, is to be considered very carefully. Um, if you can do these on a regular basis, you can start to create a culture of feedback. If design reviews happen once a month, it's hard to create a culture of feedback because you just don't get any practice. So if you've got junior designers you've hired and they're not great about talking about their work, the best way to coach them up is to just put them up, up in front of people and have them talk about their work more often. They might be scared about that, but they're gonna improve and get better. And also your whole team will get better at communicating. And it won't just be the design team because if you're inviting your engineering partners, product partners, other people, stakeholders who are important to the process, they're gonna get better at communicating design feedback too. Your design team is gonna hear language from executives and others that, you know, about the business and what the business is trying to achieve, and that's gonna connect them uh, more broadly. That's my colleague, Mike Davidson. Um, he used to lead the, the design team at Twitter, um, and he said this, which I, 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 I um, you know, just rings very true in, in my experience, that psychological safety in an organization, um, in an organizational sense, is the feeling that it's okay to take a risk and be vulnerable in front of uh, other people. And the best way to get to that point is by practicing. So a cadence of design reviews happening on a regular basis, you are being vulnerable. When you present the work, your work that you've been doing, and you, you know, have that facilitated and you get input from other people who are not on your team, that's a vulnerable place to be. But the more you do it, the more comfortable you be, become, and then you have psychological safety. This is the stuff that great teams are made of, when you feel safe to give feedback to one another. It's how you build rapport. It's how you build relationships. So here's the cadence that, I don't know if they still follow this at Apple, but when Bob Baxley was at Apple, um, this is the design review cadence that they followed. Um, Bob said that the, the cadence was a bit like Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, that you would come in on Monday morning and you, know, you would figure out, these, these are the ideas for the, the show that we're gonna ship on Saturday, and then you'd go through the steps. And the steps look like this. I don't think it was quite as cool at Apple as uh, when John Belushi is sloppily eating lunch. Uh, on Monday, there's a staff meeting where you define the work. On Tuesday, the team reviews all of the roughs, so there's like early sketch ideas. 
Um, and by the way, what, what Derek was saying earlier about not going too fast to high fidelity is, is an important thing here because high fidelity means I've got it figured out. If you show something high fidelity to an engineer, for example, they think, oh, you already worked it all through, now you just want me to execute. And in that situation, developers are gonna say, no, we can't do that. And no, behind the no is, I wasn't consult consulted. So showing a sketch um, is, is a very helpful way to bring people in. The third day on Wednesday is a work day. So everyone's trying to work through the, you know, the feedback that they got on Tuesday on these early roughs. On Thursday, the team reviews the refined work and, and sorts through that again. So lots of feedback happening um, each step of the way. And then on Friday, Bob calls it pencils down. Give me all the work. He would assemble it into a keynote deck and then you'd go present it to Eddie Q um, for executive review. So that was like every week. And it took me a while looking at this and then I realized, oh, this is basically a design sprint. It's pretty similar, right? Just curious, raise your hand if you're doing design sprints in your organization. Okay, so it's a fair number. So the specifics here, I'm sharing this not to say you should do this because I see a lot of teams that don't do this. But what I like about this example is the conscious decision of the cadence of how the work will be reviewed. And the reason why Bob holds uh, this, this view that the design review is everything is because it drives the work. It's, you know, this is driving the process of when we're going to make things, when it's gonna be seen by other people, it keeps us moving forward. It drives the momentum. And the polish. How polished should the work be? I believe that, you know, if work is rough early on, um, that brings more people into the process. Sketching is a really valuable tool. Um, that's why the crazy eights exercise, maybe those of you who raised your hand that you're doing sprints in your organization, uh, it's a really powerful tool because Crazy Eights is make eight drawings in five minutes or less, and because it's time boxed, everyone's drawings look terrible. They look so ugly. It's not like highly refined where you've got your beret and you're sipping the cappuccino looking at Notre Dame. It, it's, not, it's not sophisticated. And because there's no polish, more people can be involved in the process. So I talked to some other folks about polish and their philosophies and how Lack of polish or more polish affects the partnerships and, and who is, is involved in the process. Do you all know who Jeff Tehan is? Tehan and Lax, and then his company was acquired by Facebook. Well, now he leads the design team that designs Newsfeed in Facebook. Uh, I'm gonna let him tell you about his view on polish with his team's work. In order for the design team to really have a voice and to, and, to, and to gain a really good reputation. It's not just about producing good work and, and impressing like the leads or the executives of a company. I think uh, having them presented obviously when we're doing reviews is important, but I also really think it's important for them to feel comfortable in showing work in progress. Because I think oftentimes in this industry, we really value the highly polished um, artifact, and that's what gets presented, and it's a very clean and polished story. Uh, and I think that that's great, but I think there should be room, and we should have a comfort as a design industry to share some stuff that's like not quite as thought through, um, even maybe at, the, at, at some higher levels, so that they can also have a part uh, in helping to shape it. So leaving the door open for other people to have ideas and to be part of the process is really key. I mentioned earlier that design is a team sport. The teams that I see that are successful, that have this, this tight dialogue and rapport with different teams and different members who, uh, of the company, they think about this stuff. How do I let other people into the process instead of guarding that and, and you know, keeping it jealously? Retrospectives are another powerful tool. And this, those of you who have Agile is, is the, the, the religion of the land where you work. Um, you're probably familiar with the idea of a retrospective. It's just a, a process of looking back. What did we do? Um, how was the process? What did we do well? What did we do not so well? Teams that do this continue to learn and they continue to get better. So learning from every success and every failure is a very powerful thing. 
It's something we try to teach our children. I think we could probably take that, that lesson on board ourselves. Um, Matt Spiel, who used to lead design at Treehouse, teamtreehouse.com, maybe you've seen. Now he's over at Lyft. And I really admire the way that he um, has run retrospectives in the past. I'm going to share his process with you. So he told me that retrospectives are a valuable tool to use because they help teams identify the strengths and weaknesses. They help provide an opportunity to give feedback on our process in order to grow and improve. And again, creating that, that vulnerability of you know, talking about what we didn't do so well is that's a very vulnerable situation. So Matt always ran um, these meetings, a retrospective meeting, where he'd bring the team together, um, his design team. We just shipped a thing uh, last week. Uh, so they've had their moment of celebration. We did it. We got it out the door. Let's go have a beer. Um, and then it's time to get, to be get together and, and look at, at, at how they did. He did this really smart thing, because what, what you could do is just say, let's have a retrospective meeting. What do you think? How did we do? What could we have done better? And just ask directly. But what you're going to get is a lot of confirmation bias. Of someone who says, we did this really well, you get a lot of nodding heads. Someone else says, we didn't do this so well, you get a lot of nodding heads. And so you get a shallow um, view of, of the work. So Matt would send out a survey. And could have just been like a, a simple plain text email he'd send his team and say, um, ask him a few questions. What did we do really well? What did we not do so well? Um, and you know, rate the team and individual performance. So if you're rating our team on this project on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, 1 being the worst, where would you put us? And then rate yourself. How was your contribution on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best? So he looks at that. And when he gets those, the, that, uh, those results back and he sees some big deltas of someone who says the team was a 10 and someone who said the team was a 2, what's that about? He can have an individual conversation with those people before the meeting. So he can surface that and bring that out. Otherwise, people are going to bury that stuff and it's just never going to come out. Um, have you heard of start, stop, keep? So this is part of the process as well. It's just, it's very simple. Um, looking at what we did, um, you know, we should start doing this going forward, a better QA process. We should stop doing this thing going forward, um, you know, not having enough meetings perhaps, and keep doing these things that we did this time. So start, stop, keep is just a very simple framework. You could walk out of the meeting, you know, have a whiteboard of start, stop, keep, and let's list the things for each one of those. Um, so we can continue to do what, what we're doing really well and then build upon that. So let's talk about the infrastructure. Language shapes the work, and language is also an important part of the infrastructure. The infrastructure influences the, our language um, and, and vice versa. Um, so when we think about team structures, this is an, what I would call infrastructure. Um, the way that we're organized and working together affects our language. Uh, I remember visiting a major financial institution, one that you're probably familiar with, um, and going in and talking to them. They had a centralized team, design team, like this. So that white dot being design team, pink dots being engineering and other, other teams within the company. And I, I remember just asking a simple question of like, um, you know, sitting there talking to the heads of design, like, Where's the, where are the engineers? And he said, over there. And I thought, oh, okay, interesting, they're over there. And that gesture said to me, we're not together. We're not part of, there's, there's, there's something behind that that there's not a strong partnership there. Probe further and that turned out to be true. It's not to say that a centralized model is necessarily a bad thing. It's just that um, it's good for some things. So the past couple days, we heard a lot of conversation about design systems. Great organizational model for developing design systems. If you've got a design team that's young and up and coming and you need to build culture and language and build your muscles around design reviews, this is great because you're together and you can build that together very immediately. The problem is that building those partnerships with the rest of the company becomes a lot more challenging. 
It's easy to be opaque, to be a black box that people don't understand and they don't value. And there are other structures. There's decentralized. If you're agile, um, there's a, 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 it's pretty typical for a designer to be with a bunch of engineers. And that's going to change language a lot. And then there are hybrid models. Spotify, for example, um, they have a centralized design systems team. Also, Shopify um, has a similar model. Um, and then they have a whole series of, of decentralized cross-functional teams. What's this have to do with language? Well, there are situations where you get an agile island. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about ratios that it's like one designer with 11 engineers. Sound familiar? Does that change language? Does that change the way you work? Yes, it does. So when you hear Val's recommendation that we should start using animation, um, or you start thinking about web typography and so forth, and you're one designer with 11 engineers convincing them, let's take the extra time to do uh, animation and relative font sizing and so forth, that's a tough sell. Because they're thinking about a different value system of how many lines of code do we have to support? Um, how long will it take to, to produce and so forth? So there are different ways to solve that problem, to build an infrastructure where language can still flourish in, on an agile, agile island. So there's something called paired design. Paired programming is very common with agile and developers. You can do the same for designers. And I found that this is happening at Slack. So Slack does have these sorts of ratios where it's like one designer and then a whole boatload of engineers. It's just, it's not uncommon. And by the way, those ratios, um, according to our research, they're not necessarily a leading indicator that design is not going to do well, because you can still be successful with design, still have high impact if you have those, those rough ratios. It's just not a perfect world where you always get uh, a golden ratio of, of design and, and, and engineering. So we talked to uh, Diogenes Burrito. Um, he is a designer at Slack, and he talks a bit about how they use paired design to, to be proactive and get unstuck. Here, the designers are assigned to groups in pairs. Groups are teams in pairs. So there's always a lead designer um, who's the uh, point of contact for that particular project, but they're always working with another designer who's also assigned to that project. So making it official in that way means that, you know, it kind of it gives the other designer the ability to be like, this is one of my real projects, like it is in my set of priorities, I'm, I'm gonna devote real time to it, and I can, you know, I can say that to my team and they know that it's like part of the job, right? Um, but also, I think it helps when you're, uh, it helps avoid not being able to see the forest for the trees as like being the primary designer on a project because they have just a little bit of distance because they're working, um, you know, maybe not on that project as the primary designers, but they have all of the context around, you know, they've been working with that team on an ongoing basis. They understand, you know, for example, in the case of platform, they understand that you're working on this kind of tool for developers, they understand the constituencies of like an admin who needs to regulate apps in the company, a user who wants to install the apps, a developer who just wants to figure out what it can do and how to do it, that kind of thing. So it's really nice to be able to have that other person to just, to never be blocked for any long period of time to just kind of turn around and be like, what do you think of A versus B? And having that kind of collaboration be really low friction means that I think it, it just brings the quality of everything up. Yeah. So designers don't feel isolated. They've got someone to kind of dialogue, push back and forth on. Um, I do think that being a designer in these, these cross-functional teams is great because, you know, speaking of language, you're, you're a stranger in a strange land. You're learning a new language. You're learning about engineering. You're learning about how to incorporate that thinking into your design process. And that's tremendously valuable. Um, to your current position and, of course, in, in future positions in your career. Design operations is something that keeps popping up over and over again, and it is a part of, of infrastructure. Um, have you heard, I'm just curious, by a show of hands, who has heard of the idea of design operations? Okay, so still a small number, but, uh, but a few of you. So 
Um, there, there's been DevOps for a long time because engineering teams have scaled um, long ago and, and had to confront this, these issues of scale and communication. Um, and engineering teams are, are, are scaling now, uh, not at the not size of engineering, but scaling, so they need operations being built into um, what they're doing. And design operations is essentially, it's covering a lot of ground. Um, we see companies like Pinterest, they have specific things that they're doing, like they've got a new, a new role, which is a producer, someone who guides the project along and clears roadblocks. Then we see companies like USAA, which is a you know, big insurance agency. Um, they have a chief of staff, someone who works directly with the VP of design or the chief design officer to make sure that the design team has what they need. But it's a lot of um, external communication um, they drive cadence of design reviews, they bring people into the process, they communicate. So design operations is all about language and connection. Um, we found that this was such a huge topic that we, um, my team the, at um, Envision just published a book, the Design Ops Handbook. It's free, it's, it's online um, at designbetter.co, and it's written by Meredith Black, who's the head of, of uh, design ops at Pinterest, Dave Maloof, who co-founded IXDA, Kate Battles um, at Fitbit, and, um, and others. So interesting people that are, are you know, on the front lines trying to solve these operations issues. Um, we talked to Josh Ohm, who um, is the head of design at Oracle, about how he runs his teams. Fascinating guy, designer to the core, but when he thinks about how to solve problems with design teams, he thinks very much like an engineer, uh, like a business person, like connecting all the things. Um, fascinating approach to how he's running his team. So he's gonna share a bit about design operations at Oracle. I think it's incredibly important to have a operation function as part of the design team. So what I found is that um, as design is figuring out its process, it's often trying to mesh that into the rest of the product development process, usually engineering. And engineering has a operations function that manages the process of the development, but oftentimes design doesn't mesh one to one with that process. Either they're a sprint ahead, or they're working in parallel, or the things they're working on, maybe the timing is different. What may take a sprint for engineering to develop will take design three sprints, or design can do something in one sprint, which engineering is gonna take three sprints. And so if design often relies on the development function to run the operations for the product development, um, oftentimes balls get dropped and the, the alignment isn't right. So um, I've learned early on to have a design operations function which specifically plans the way in which design will release its product back into the product development cycle. And so I build out these uh, operations organizations to do that. So I wanna make sure that my designers are designing and not worried about is their computer working? Do they have the software they need? Do they know what they need to deliver? Have they delivered it on time? Who do they need to communicate with? How do they communicate with that person? How should they deliver? I want designers designing. And so operations are basically responsible for all the overhead that makes design happen. Um, and it usually fits into two camps. One camp is the, um, the HRE, human resource -y part of just we're a bunch of humans working together and designers are special. How do we make sure designers have what designers need? And then the other part of it is the how does design release its product over to mesh into another process, i.e. engineering and development. So then we've got program managers that are actually tracking the delivery of design and making sure that that process of our delivery meshes with the process of development coming in and figuring out how we align those deliveries together. So those of you who are working in agencies, the, the idea of a producer might sound really familiar. Um, and the, the notion of, of producers finding its way into product teams actually comes from companies acquiring agencies like you know, Jeff Tehan's company, um, hot studio out of San Francisco. Um, so that, that role came in from the agency world and is finding its way into lots of different types of companies. And part of what design operations does, um, I, I really like this phrase because this is often really needed. If you've ever been pulled in the hallway, like, hey, can I just get five minutes of your time to look at this design problem? and then three hours later, you're like still working on that thing. Um, designers sometimes need safe harbor 
that the, the work gets routed in the right directions. Um, so they're not, they're not spending a bunch of cycles that were unplanned. Colin Whitehead, who leads design operations at Dropbox, talks about this. Um, he also co-wrote the Design Ops Handbook. He said, if a team knows when to expect feedback from specific people, whether from the CEO or other stakeholders, uh, they can tailor the presentation of their work to reflect how it addresses things like revenue goals, this design will increase conversions, product goals, this redesign will make features more discoverable, et cetera. And what's more, a design producer can set expectations and explain to stakeholders what type of feedback is needed at each particular stage in the design process. So this ties back to the design review process, getting the right people involved at the right time um, to get the, get the feedback that's needed. So let's talk about one last piece uh, of language and how it affects the organization, because it certainly does. When we're working with lots of different types of, of teams, uh, working with engineers, that example I shared earlier of, of Stanley Wood at Spotify, his miscommunication was just a translation misfire. Engineers didn't understand what he meant by this work's not very good. So we need to get better at speaking multiple languages. I've observed that over the years, designers, we've, we've been very good at honing our craft, at sharpening our tools, and ultimately that's kind of culminated into a point where we're very navel gazy of like, okay, this is what we do, this is what, as Josh uh, Ulm just said, designers are special. Okay, there's some truth to that, but also we're part of a bigger system, and we have to see that we're part of a bigger system. And if we don't, it's hard, it's hard for our team to succeed, and it's hard for our career to succeed. So we need to be able to speak to different partners in different language that they can understand. If we were to go to engineers and talk um, about you know, specific typography terms and so forth, it might get lost and be disinterested. So we have to tie it back to things that, that are meaningful to them. So speaking to business goals, not to design goals. This, not to be misunderstood is let's not talk about you know, with design language. We do that. We do that in our own territory with our, our fellow designers. But when we're giving a presentation to executives or we're having a design review um, you know, with a bunch of engineers, we need to shift our language. We need to be really good at that. This is Meredith Black, who leads design operations at Pinterest. I mentioned her early, earlier. Um, she says that design starts with the business priorities that the company needs, and then it narrows down into product teams. So we can talk about design debt. You know, when we talk about design systems, this is a phrase that comes up a lot. Why does that matter? Well, let's translate that. Design de debt might slow our time to market, and that's a problem. Uh, when I've talked to companies and how they've sold the idea of a design system, they said, it was super easy. I was just at the Home Depot, um, their, their headquarters recently, and they said it was easy to sell that uh, because it sped up our time to market. We talk about UX crashes, this, this phrase that, that Stanley Wood from Spotify used. Um, why is that important? Why is that meaningful? Because it reduces retention. We start to lose customers, and we can't be a successful business if we're just bleeding customers, right? That gets people's attention. They pay attention, and they realize that you pay attention to the bigger picture of the company and what you're trying to achieve. Um, I hear a lot of design teams asking, how should we be measuring our success? Um, and there's not really a, 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 a single way to do it. Every team has a different set of KPIs or metrics that they use to measure their success. But there is one that is often referred to. It's a few years old at this point, but it's still proving very valuable. And that is Google's HEART framework. Have you heard of that one before? So HEART is an acronym for happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Task success can be measured with usability testing. Retention is, you know, we can look at metrics of, you know, with the business. By the way, retention shows up in almost all the frameworks that we see. There's also pirate metrics, um, A-R-R-R-R-R, and one of those R's is retention. So that is a common one. Adoption of like, 
did they sign up and then they stayed with the product um, engagement? Um, that can mean lots of different things for different companies. Happiness could be NPS scores. Um, there are varied perspectives on whether or not that's meaningful and if we actually can move the needle on NPS. Uh, so I'll skip that, but um, co-creation. Co-creation is a really important thing, and I've certainly alluded to it a number of places uh, so far. Sketching brings more people into the process. Design reviews bringing other people into that communication. The co-creation process is a powerful thing. And when I see companies that are old school dinosaurs trying to go through a digital transformation, um, highly regu regulated financial institutions that they, they're just new to this whole digital thing. Um, the ones that are doing it and figuring out how to make a transformation, there's some sort of co-creation piece at the heart of their work. Um, and, and this notion of design centricity, we want a seat at the table, we want design to be valued. Well, that happens when we, you know, pull back the veil and we bring more people in with this co-creation process. Design centricity develops by inviting participation in design. The, the common reaction to this is that I'm a designer, you can't design, we do this special thing, if I show you how we do this, I'm gonna lose my power. But you actually, it's the opposite. You gain more power by bringing more people into what you do. You gain more power by um, Dismantling the magic. And design sprints are this tool. I mean, they're, they're sort of pedestrian at this point in that the book has been out for a few years, New York Times bestseller from Jake Knapp. Uh, maybe you've read it, uh, it's, it's a great read. It's a great structure, a time boxed way to work together on, to solve a big problem. Sprints don't work for everything, they don't, but they do work for a lot of different things. Um, we talked to uh, Northwestern Mutual, so here's a big, old school, 100 plus year financial institution using design sprints. This is an example of a company trying to go through a transformation and bring more people in. This is Scott Yim, um, who's a senior designer there. We did run into some obstacles, particularly with the design sprint, we've worked really hard to dispel the myth that you have to be a designer in order to contribute something valuable. The whole culture that, that I try to foster on the team is, hey, bad ideas um, are not a thing in this room. It's a safe space. And on the opposite end, the good ideas can come from anywhere, but also when we're sketching or we're you know putting brainstorming ideas out there, just making sure that everyone knows that you have something valuable to offer um, from your own discipline and that it's not expected that you can hop into sketch or um, Photoshop or um, that you have this extensive background in design. It's just not necessary. And so we leave it pretty open, um, whether you can use words, you can sketch, you can draw boxes, whatever that is, um, just get your ideas out on paper and there's always an opportunity afterwards to verbally share what you're doing and what your vision is. So I think it works best when we're able to get participation from all of the stakeholders and sometimes it ends up taking a bit more time for us. One really neat thing that we've done is we've actually flown out to some financial advisors offices across the country. They're such an invaluable part of our feedback process and our, our knowledge loop that getting them involved in a design sprint-esque kind of um, meeting or uh, day has been extremely valuable to us. So they're co-creating with people who are not designers, who might be scared of the idea of sketching. They might be embarrassed. It feels like this is not a safe space. People will make fun of me. They'll see that I'm not good at drawing. But they're dismantling that. Just use words or just scribbles, whatever it takes. And they're also working with customers um, to work through ideas more quickly. Um, also a common theme, so we wrote a book about it, Enterprise Design Sprints, um, that just, just came out. Um, so if sprints are something that you're working on and you want to start to fold this into your process, experiment with it, um, the guy who wrote this, Richard Banfield, really sharp guy, and he looks at companies that are at different levels of maturity. So if your company, like if you feel, okay, we're, we've, we're, we're back 
here. We're still trying to figure some stuff out. He talks about how to introduce this into your, your workflow. The other thing, um, besides design sprints, is internal workshops. This is a recurring thing. Um, design thinking is used a lot, thrown around a lot. Doing design thinking workshops. Um, and sometimes changing them something else, the, the name to something else, like it's a spark session, an innovation session. Come on in, let's work on this together. It's a way to bring people into the design process and they see it. Um, what I saw at Home Depot recently when I visited them, they're doing a lot of sprints, is that now engineers are facilitating design sprints. And they're, um, I, I mentioned that sprints don't work for every situation. So they'll pull out an activity from a sprint and they'll use that in their day-to-day -day practice. So it starts to fold into the language and the ethos of the company. Uh, these are some places where I see these internal workshops really changing things. IBM, massive company, uh, one of the biggest on the planet. Cisco, um, also very engineering focused. The Home Depot I mentioned, Nationwide Insurance and Northwestern Mutual. These are just a few examples. So they're not the Googles, right? They're not Facebook. They're, you know, any company can fold these into the process and bring more people in. And that's what they all say. I say, what's the, what's the greatest value of a design sprint to you? And they say, getting the attention of other people, getting people their time and, and their, their commitment to the process. Abigail Gray, who leads the, the Northwest uh, Mutual team, she says, you know, workshops are really good for getting people's buy-in and if they're part of the process, you're also making use of that valuable knowledge that's stuck in their heads, which designers may not know. I'm sure we've all felt some pain from work, uh, maybe even Sunday evening, not looking forward to going into work the next day because there's some political crap that you have to deal with and it's just, why is this part of my job, right? We've probably all felt that before. That happens when people feel isolated and separated and they don't understand what you're doing. These sorts of things, the co-creation process, it puts out those fires before they start. It brings people in and it makes us happier in our work. So the other thing that comes out of these internal workshops or sprints is that there's a shared language and a shared process. And I talked earlier about translation, all these specializations and so forth. This is kind of like, you know, uh, a language that can be universal, that can bring us together, that we understand. So language, 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 a very powerful, important thing. I mentioned at the top of this presentation that most of the people I've seen let go, or I've had to let go, wasn't their hard skills that were lacking, it was their soft skills. And it made me wonder, it, it changed my hiring process, actually, how I screen um, who I want to hire and, and bring onto my team. I, I over-index on soft skills because um, those are harder for me to coach up, hard skills I can coach up. And when I help people you know, further their careers, I, I'm often thinking about how can I help them with language, how can I help them with their soft skills to interact and bring more people into the process. Language is so powerful, it fuels a culture of feedback and when we have a culture of feedback, we can be vulnerable together. We can push the work further, further than we thought it could go. Um, language is important and it's, you know, it thrives, our work thrives when it's supported by an infrastructure. There's design operations, um, there's all sorts of activities and uh, like sprints and so forth that can be folded into our infrastructure that can uh, make us more successful. And ultimately, we need to be more aligned with the business. What are the problems we're trying to solve as a business? Being able to translate our language to the language of business is a powerful thing. And if there's one word, if you walked, if you erased everything else, erase it all, I think back to my tenure founding the design team at, at MailChimp, the one thing I wish I would have done better was this, was build partnerships was figure out how to build partnerships more effectively. Because when we can do that, we can make better things together. Greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much.